Praise God. So, this morning, God has given me a message from the Lord, I believe, and I've been really wanting, as the student pastor, to speak to parents and grandparents here that um, have the responsibility of raising a child. Amen? Some, there have been some grandparents that have put, been put in situations now where they are the sole provider for that child, you know? And it's like, so, you know, <laughs> here you are, you get to be a parent again. And what I have experienced in our time as youth pastors here, um, I've experienced that there are a lot of frustrated parents. There are a lot of frustrated parents in what to do. I have discovered also that my time as a youth pastor in the 90s is much different than my time as a youth pastor now. How many know the generations have changed? That it is a totally different student that I'm dealing with now than I was back in the 90s, amen? If you could put that, the title slide up there for me on the screen. So this is what God gave me this morning, divine words for desperate parents. <laughs> How many desperate parents do we have in the house, whether you're a parent or a grandparent? You're desperate, and I know you are. I sense it. I see it. And so God has given me some divine words for you today. What would you say is the toughest job any adult could ever have? What do you guys think? Come on, be bold. What is the toughest job that any adult could ever have? Uh, cutting trees. That's a pretty tough job, right, Trevor? <laughs> that is. Amen. But parents, what would you say? And maybe you say, well, that's not really a job, but you know what I'm saying. What is the toughest job you could ever have? What? Raising a child. Parenting, right? Raising a job or parenting. How many would agree that that is the toughest job you could ever have? Come on. Say, owe me or help me or something. Amen. <laughs> you know it's true. One thing is for sure, and, and this is a fact that you can trace all through history, and that is this. When Satan wants to do great damage, he'll attack the family. He will attack the family. It is his favorite weapon that he has in his arsenal is an attack on the family. Because he knows that if he can weaken the family or even weaken the foundation of the family, that the crack that's in the foundation will sooner or later make that family just crumble. That's what he loves to do. We've been teaching our teenagers John 10.10, 10, and they've all been memorizing this passage of Scripture. And this is what it says. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy but I have come that you may have life and life more abundantly. It is his objective to destroy anything he can. And his favorite target, I believe, is the family. Trying to kill it, trying to destroy it, trying to steal anything he can from that family. When I think about my own family, let me share with you a little bit of history of the Enix family, okay? How many of you would like to know a little history about the Enix family? Listen to this. I was 19, and Tina was 20 years old when we found out Jeffrey II was coming soon. 19, I was 19, I was still a teenager, 19 years old. I had been in Bible college one year at that point. I spent one year away from Tina, where I was six hours away from her, and I said, I'm not spending another minute six hours away from the one I love, amen? So we got married that summer in between my first and second year of college. We moved into marriage housing, lived in a ran, ran down old trailer, and we went to pumping plasma to try to survive, amen? <laughs> that was our jobs. We didn't have no jobs, no nothing, except for on-campus stuff. And that summer, our um, assistant coach ran a water slide. I was playing basketball in college, and our assistant coach was running Wet Willie's water slide. 
And so we both became lifeguards at Wet Willie's Water Slide. And let me tell you what, then we find out, ah, we got one on the way. So needless to say, we were not prepared for this, amen? But you know, my question to you is this, are we ever prepared for that? <laughs> you know, very few of us are prepared for that. But that's when we found out, but, but check this out. Within the next three years, I said the next three years, we added Tasha and we added Talissa. So in the first four years of our marriage, it seemed like my wife was pregnant the whole time. <laughs> she was pregnant the whole time. In fact, our first position was in Memphis, Tennessee, and the pastor there began to call my wife Fertile Myrtle. <laughs> Because it seemed like that she was just pregnant all the time. And he'd always say, did you ever figure out what's causing that, Pastor Jeff? i said, well, help me out there, Pastor. All right? But it didn't, we didn't stop there. We loved parenting and we loved family so much that we added three others. We added Anthony, Dustin, and then Elijah as we were foster parents and eventually ended up adopting these three children. So we had six. We just love parenting so much that we had six children. Needless to say, we were young, we were clueless when it came to parenting, but you know what? We learned together to seek God for the wisdom that we needed, amen? I don't care what it is that you're needing, turn to God. What kind of wisdom that you're needing, turn to God and he'll supply for you. And it amazes to me, I'm not sure how this happens. I, I mean, I know how it happens now if you have a Facebook account, but almost as soon as you visit the doctor to confirm that you're pregnant, you start getting coupons for formula in the mail. How many know that? You know, and like I said, I know how it happens on Facebook because Facebook is listening to you, and if you talk about it, it's going to be in your, in your, um, on your page next, you know? Seems like that. But you start getting all these coupons. You start getting uh, coupons for formula and diapers and magazines, right, that include all kinds of articles about how to raise a healthy, well-adjusted child. They're going to tell you how to do this thing, right? And they give you all these kind of articles like here's five steps to da 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 da, da right? Or they got these that say, um, all right, uh, how, how about uh, ten steps to better parenting or, or, you know, something like that. All these different um, articles, ten ways to get your child to da 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 da, da. And all of these magazines can fool us into thinking that if we're hard enough, if we try hard enough, and if we do everything right, then our child will become and do everything that we want, right? But this is so easy. There's nothing to it, man. Just do what the experts say. But listen, but anyone who's been a parent for long knows parenting requires a lot more than that. Am I, am I right? Parenting requires so much more than that, more simply than following the right steps to success, that to raise a child towards godliness, we need much more than good advice. What do we need, church? We need the power and the guidance of the Holy Spirit in order to be the parent that God intends for us to be. I don't see how people that don't know Jesus parent. Because you know what? When we were parenting, there wasn't a day that went by when I'd say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need you. You know, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, here is a good reason for you to cry out to Jesus because we all need Jesus. We all need the help 
of the Holy Spirit when it comes to parenting or any other issue in life. We need the commands and expectations of Scripture to keep us from complacency. Amen? We need that in our lives, man. We need the grace and mercy of Scripture to save us from guilt when we feel like we aren't just doing right, huh? How many of you have ever been through a guilt trip because you felt like that you were failing as a parent? Yeah. We need the Scripture to remove remove that from our lives. We need the Word of God to puncture the pride that rises up within us when our child is doing great, when they're making the honor roll, when they're on the first team of the athletic team, no matter what it is, you know, when when they are in the honor society, and man, they are getting student of the month and all that kind of stuff, and we start to puff up with pride and say, look what I'm doing. (laughs) Look what I'm doing. How many know it's much more than that? While we have influence as a responsibility, listen, we need to come to the conclusion of this, that we don't really have control over our child. We really don't. We can teach our children the scriptures, and I pray that you are teaching them the word of God. Listen, if there's any discipleship that's going to happen, it's going to be in your home. I believe that is the number one place of discipleship. That is one of the biggest frustrations as a youth pastor is this, is that when parents expect the youth pastor to do all the biblical training, all the discipling, putting all the Holy Spirit that we can inside of your kids. Listen, I only get them for an hour and a half a week, but you have them every day. Where is the biggest bulk of ministry going to take place? It must take place in your home. And if you never crack the Bible at home, if you never kneel as a family in prayer together, then guess what? Your kids aren't going to get what they need. How many know that we need to be the spiritual figure in our parents' home, in our our home as parents, amen? We need to be the spiritual figure in our home. We can confront sinful patterns that need to change, and we should do that. We shouldn't just let them run off and, and do what they could do, but we can't generate spiritual life that leads to lasting change. Only the Spirit of God can do that. Only the Holy Spirit can bring lasting change in the lives of our children. What can we, we, what we can do is this. We can pray for and we can parent our children the best that we know how. We can trust God to do what we cannot. Have you ever been in one of those impossible situations where you didn't know which way to turn? You didn't know what to do. I've been there. God, I just don't know what to do here. A parenting situation maybe where things just continue to go from bad to worse. And you think, God, what do I got to do to break this cycle that's happening? God, I don't know what to do to intervene in the lives of my children. Have you ever desperately needed something or wanted something? We already sang about that. God, I'm desperate for you. Have you been in that place before? But it seemed as though there was no way you would ever have the breakthrough that you needed. God, am I ever going to see a breakthrough with this child? Maybe it's just too late. Come on, have you asked yourself some of these questions? I sure did. I sure did as a parent. If so, then you need to know more about the power of God that can take place through prayer. Everybody shout prayer. That's where it's at. We have got to come become moms and dads that are prayer warriors. We have got to become moms and dads that are intercessors for our children. We need to make sure that when they walk out that door every day that we are bathing and covering them in prayer. Amen? Praise God that, man, we are inviting 
Jesus to walk with them wherever they go throughout that day. We find an example over this in 2 Chronicles 20. And this is not a part of the notes because this is something else that God gave me at the last minute. And I said, okay, God, we'll throw this in there. But we know in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, the story where the bottom had suddenly dropped out for King Jehoshaphat. That's just a fun word to say in it. Jehoshaphat. <laughs> Are you thankful God, did? God didn't inspire your parents to name you Jehoshaphat? Woo, I sure am, all right. But 2 Chronicles 20, everything was going wrong. He was the king of Judah, so he was responsible for even much more than his own family. But he received this frightening report saying, there's a vast army that's coming against you. They're going to overtake you. They're going to destroy you. So what did Jehoshaphat do? Did he throw up his hands and say, oh, man, we just got to get out of here. We got to run. Did he tremble in fear? No, you know what he did? He prayed. I said he prayed. He prayed. In fact, <laughs> this is what he said. Verse 12 of 2 Chronicles chapter 20. This is what he said. He said, oh, our God, you, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do. Oh, come on, catch this. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Did you hear me? God... I don't know what to do, but my eyes, they're upon you, Lord. Then I love what happens in the next verse. Verse number 13 of chapter 20 of 2 Chronicles. We read this. Now all Judah, with their little ones, their wives, and their children, they stood before the Lord. Man, isn't that beautiful? Did you catch what's happening there? This is one of those passages that sometimes we've just read over so many times that we didn't even see it. The entire family stood before God, prayed together for wisdom and victory. It looks like to me that they created a family altar crying out, God, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. So we gather together as a family, and we pray for wisdom, and we pray for victory. Come on, do you see it this morning? Do you see it this morning? And the powerful thing that happened, oh, that's such a powerful scene, that multitudes of vulnerable people, invading army come against them, King Jehoshaphat cries out the prayer, hallelujah, and God intervened, amen? God intervened and brought the victory and the wisdom that they needed. What if, what if they wouldn't have prayed as an entire family together? What if not? What if they didn't have their eyes upon God? What would have happened? I dare say that they probably would have been wiped out, destroyed, uh, probably all of them killed, amen? But God intervened. Why? Because they put their eyes in the right spot. Amen? They turned towards him. Maybe your cry is this. God, I don't know how to be a good parent. Maybe the parenting that you received as a child wasn't that great either. And so you come into this thing of parenting that you say, I don't know how to be a good parent. It's never modeled before me, God. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to be a good parent, but I'm depending upon you, Lord. Amen. I don't know the situation that you may be going through, but God, my eyes are upon you. My eyes are upon you, Lord. Here's the problem. And I'm almost to the message, all right? <laughs> Here's the problem. Too many of us think of prayer as a last resort. Oh, 
okay, God, I've tried this and this and this and this. Didn't work. And so now I guess I'll pray. Hmm? So instead of prayer being our steering wheel, it becomes our spare tire. Wow. That we only pull it out when we got a flat, Brother Carl. <laughs> when we got a flat, I go for that spare tire. When all along, prayer should be our steering wheel, amen? Giving us the direction that we need. Can I just suggest to you that if you make prayer your steering wheel instead of your spare tire, that you will have to fight a lot less battles, amen? Come on. Come on, how many agree with me to, this morning? You have to fight a lot less battles. It's been said that if you're swept off your feet, you don't know what to do, get on your knees, amen? Get on your knees. Because I believe God answers the prayers of his people, and he can turn around radical, hopeless situations when God's people go to him in prayer. He could turn it around. But how or what do we pray? How or what do we pray? Listen, the scriptures help us with that too. Isn't that good? How many love the book of Psalms? Oh, just a couple of you. How many love the book of Psalms? Uh, let's just forget that. How many love the word of God? <laughs> Amen? Listen, but the book of Psalms in particular, it's... It's a book of prayer. It's a book of worship, which I believe is the highest form of prayer. Amen? Listen, it's a book that we can go to to give us divine words of wisdom from him. And it provides us with not only wisdom and perspective for parenting, but I believe it, it gives us the same thing for any situation that you may be, may be here. Don't check out because you're not a parent anymore this morning. Because this message is still for you, okay? It's still for you. So let's get into it. Number one, our children are, and you should have your worship guide there, and you could take notes within there. Number one is this. Our children are in his grip, not ours. Yeah. Come on, just say it with me. Our children are. Say it with me. Come on. Our children are in his grip, not ours. Okay? And again, apply this to whatever situation in life you may be in this morning. Okay? But from the time the children are newborns, we are totally infatuated with and concerned about their progress. Right? Because medical, the medical field tells you they should be doing this here. And they should be doing this here. And at this age, they should be doing this. And if they're not doing this at this age, then there's something seriously wrong. I just found out yesterday that Karsten, our grandson that is one years old now, is al already knows his ABCs and he can count to 10. I'd say that kid's pretty much a genius, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's amazing that he can do that, all right? But you know what? He's doing things much earlier. Does that mean he's going to be a genius? Probably not. Probably not. But we totally, totally freak out if they're not doing what everybody says they should be doing, right? We want to know what we can do. What can we feed them? What can we teach them? How can we train them to keep them moving to that bright, beautiful future, right? And then during the school years, our potential fear of confidence rises and falls on how well are they progressing in school. Heaven forbid if they have to be held back a year to get something, you know? Man, if they have to be held back, oh my gosh, there's something wrong with my kid what is going on 
If they can't play sports the way that you think that they should play sports, there's something wrong with my kid. Physically, if they're not getting as tall as they should, or maybe they're a little bit on the chubby side. What's going on here? Or socially, they're just not talking and saying the words that they should. They're not interacting with other kids the way they should. so upset about it and then they make it through school and begin to emerge into adulthood here's something that I've discovered that when they leave your home you're still not done parenting <laughs> how many of you have just experienced that in your life when they leave the home you aren't done parenting just forget that amen you're going to be parenting them Till the day that they get taken home with Jesus, probably, you know? You're still going to, but as they emerge into young adulthood, we can't help but set timelines for them, right? And we say, man, you need to, what, finish your education, right? Finish your education. You need to, oh, here's one, you need to find a mate. <laughs> You need to find somebody to marry because you know what? You ain't staying in my house no more, right? <laughs> okay? You need to find a mate or maybe even things like this. You need to establish a career. Quit bouncing around from job to job. You need to find something to focus on and do it. And if they're not doing that, we think, man, we really failed these kids. We really failed them. And all along the way, we often think and act and feel as if it's up to us. We think that we have to supply everything that's needed to our children to chart them out a path for their lives and to make it happen. And if it doesn't happen, here's where the guilt comes in. We feel like it's all our fault. Wow, I got some good news for you. It's not your fault. It's not all your fault. King David understood this so much. In Psalms 31, verses 14 through 15, look at this. King David said these words. He recognized that he wasn't ultimately in control. He said, I'm trusting you, O Lord. I'm trusting you, O Lord, saying, you are my God. And I love this. My future is in your hands. And you could put it into a parenting situation by saying this, you are my God, their future is in your hands. Their future is in your hands. I'm trusting you, God, that you are gonna take them where they need to go, amen? Can you do that? Can you trust God enough this morning to just say, God, I'm putting them in your hands? You know, there's something that the church practices that I think is so powerful called child dedication. And child dedication does not save a child, okay? There are some uh, churches that practice it and they sprinkle the child and they believe that that is baptism for that child and that 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 seals them, they're saved, they're ready to go to heaven. Grace Way does not believe that. We believe in child dedication. And when you bring that child, it's much more about the parents that are up here than it actually is the child. Because the child, the child, you know, can't make a commitment to Christ yet. The child is just a child being molded, amen? But when you come and you present that child, and Pastor D takes that child and either lays hands on that child or holds the child. This is what you were saying as a family. You were saying, God, we place this child into your hands. We place this child into your hands. God, will you bless it? Will you take it? His future is in your hands. But will you anoint these parents to raise that child in the fear of God? Amen? Amen. So it puts a responsibility upon the parents to do what? To continually.
place that child into the hands of Jesus? Do you trust God enough to say, Jesus, my children are yours. I give them to you. Lord, I want them to be in your grip. Amen? Not mine. And not just as they're a child, but Lord, and I pray this all the time, every morning, God, my children, wherever they are, whatever they're doing, I place them into your hands, God. Because you know what? He can do what needs to be done. You can't. I have children now that are some 12 to 14 hours away back in Indiana, and I just see them a couple times a year. I can't physically be there to do anything in their lives anymore. But God can be there every moment of every day. Yeah? He can do it. Praise God. So our children are in his grip, not ours. Number two, our children are in his strength, not ours. Come on, can you say it with me again this morning? Say, our children are in his strength, not ours. Mmm, I like that. As parents, we tend to be pretty hard on ourselves, don't we? We are our own worst critics. Yeah. We sure are. We are rough on ourselves. We're well aware of our deficiencies. We are well aware of all of our hypocrisies. We are determined not to raise our own children in some of the ways that we were raised. We don't necessarily agree with some of the things that mom and dad did, right? Okay. I, I could say one of the biggest examples of that is this, you know, whether it's right or whether it's wrong, we don't really know. But when I was a child, there was such a thing as time out. And that was that my mother or father took time out to whip my hind in. Yeah. <laughs> I, I always hated it. My mom was always much smaller than me. And, uh, she would say this, she would say, Jeff, you lay down on that bed, and I'm going to whoop your hind in, or you can wait till your father comes home and deal with him. And so you know what I would gladly do? <laughs> I would gladly lay down on that bed. I was going to lay down and let mama have her way, right? Let her just whip me as she felt I needed to be whipped. And because I was much bigger than her, sometimes I wouldn't get the opportunity to lay down and she would just kind of smack me maybe with whatever she had in her hand, you know. <laughs> and, you know, I'd think that, oh, I'm still being so abused, you know, all this kind of thing. And so because a lot of parents went through that, then they have come to this thing called time out where we say, now, you need to settle down, little Johnny, and you just go sit in that chair over there until you feel like your temper tantrum is over. Then you can get up, okay? Anybody heard of that before? Yeah. So whether that's right or wrong, and I'm not going to tell you whether that's right or whether that's wrong, you're the parent. However you choose to do this. I do know the Word of God says this, that you spare the rod, you spoil the child. Can I get an Amen. But how you parent is how you choose to do that. But our, we determine, man, I'm not going to do that. Maybe I'm not going to yell at my children as much as my parents yelled at me. All right? Yet, too often we instinct, instinctively repeat similar patterns. We hate it because we become what our parents were. Just kind of in our DNA. It's kind of put in there. We want to listen. Oh, how we want to listen to our kids. And can I tell you something? That is one of the greatest things that your children want from you. Just to listen. Will you take time just to let me talk to you? Right? 
We want to listen, but in our life, man, we're distracted, aren't we? We've got so much going on. We want to take the time to play with them when they're young or run with them when they're teenagers to go and do things, but we have so much work to do. Pastor Jeff, you just don't understand what all I have going on. We want to engage and help, but when we do, we throw stuff out there and it just doesn't seem to stick. <laughs> doesn't seem to help in any way. Even our most brilliant efforts at parenting don't always work well. So in steps Psalms 103. And we find some good news here. For those of us who have failed our child, good news for those of us who may have been a little too angry or impatient or even cold towards our children. Look at what it says in Psalms 103, verse 13 and 14. It said, the Lord is like a father to his children. Oh, come on. Aren't you thankful you have a heavenly father? I said, aren't you thankful you have a heavenly father? And that when you receive Christ as your Savior, you get a family of God. Amen? You are part of the family. The Lord is like a father to his children. He is tender and compassionate to those who fear him. For he knows how weak we are. I said he knows how weak you are. He understands how weak we are. And he remembers that we are only dust. Right? We're only dust. I'm so thankful this morning that we have a father who is tender and compassionate toward us. And he's not standing there pointing fingers at us and saying, I saw what you did. Oh, man, I'm angry with you, right? But he is tender. He's compassionate. He's not pointing a finger or putting us on trial. He is mindful of our limitations. He is mindful of our frustrations, hallelujah. He knows how weak we are in the faith, in discipline, in consistency, in wisdom, in relational skills. Listen, he gets us. He understands us. He knows us better than anybody else. He remembers that we're dust, just doing the best that we can in a world that we don't control to raise kids who we ultimately don't control either. Doing my best. Listen, church, lean on the Father. <laughs> lean on the Father. I'm learning to lean. Remember that song? I'm learning to lean. Learning to lean on Jesus. And again, this is not just parenting. This is anything, guys. I'm finding more power than I ever dreamed. <laughs> oh, yes, that's so good. I'm learning to lean on Jesus. That's what we got to do, right? This is what's so awesome. You lean upon the Father, He's never going to falter. He's not going to crumble from the weight of your burden. But He's going to be that rock that you need. Amen. So you know what? <laughs> it's not our strength. It's His. It is, amen? Number three, our children are raised by his voice, not ours. I've heard many parents say this, I just don't even feel like I have a voice in my own family anymore. That's frustration, isn't it? But our children are raised by his voice and not ours. Go over to Psalms 29 with me, verses 3 through 5. And when we read this, we get the sense that David is looking up at the sky and he's watching the progress of this huge storm that is sweeping over all of Israel. How often do you feel like you're just in the middle of a huge storm? The wind is blowing, the lightning is flashing, the thunder is popping, wow! And you're in the midst of this huge, dark cloud storm 
the kind like we have in Florida every day, it seems like, right? But he's not just watching it. He's doing more than just watching it. He's, he wasn't just a storm chaser, okay? But he was hearing. He was hearing what the Lord is saying to him through the storm. Hallelujah. He'll speak to you through the storm if you'll just listen. Oh, come on. I want to say that again. I said he will speak to you through the storm if you will just listen. Just listen. Psalm 29, 3 through 5 says, The voice of the Lord echoes above the sea. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty sea. Man, are you hearing his voice today? Man. Go on to the next slide, please. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord splits the mighty cedars. Come on, are you gaining how powerful the voice of the Lord is? I know sometimes the voice of the Lord is a still, small voice, right? I understand that. But the mightiness of his voice, the power behind his voice, majestic, splitting the mighty cedars. The Lord shatters the cedars of Lebanon. How? With his voice he does that. Man. When was the last time you got quiet enough to hear the voice of God? Or maybe even a better question, when was the last time you were desperate enough to stop everything to hear the voice of God? Ask yourself that. Because the Lord's voice is shattering. <laughs> the Lord's voice is striking. Listen, his voice can speak to our children like a gentle rain, a gradual understanding, or like a lightning strike of life-changing insight. You know what? Just one moment where your child hears the voice of God can change everything. Everything. Said the Lord's voice is shaking. I believe the Lord's voice can shake our children out of apathy, amen? It can shake our children out of that place of comfort that they're in to move them forward. Hmm. I like the word stripping that he says there. The Lord's voice is stripping. Just as it leaves the forest bare, lightning storm, it can peel away negative attitudes our children may be having. It can peel away arguments from our children's hearts, their minds. Just peel it all away. Amen. Come on. Do you truly believe that your child can be made into a new creation in Christ Jesus? Yes. Absolutely. This is the last, last point right here. Our children, their growth is in his timing, not ours. Our children's growth is in his timing, not ours. Would you say it with me? My children's growth is in his timing, not ours. Now, this is a topic that is very difficult for every one of us. You know what it is? Waiting on God. <laughs> Come on, it's tough to wait on God, isn't it? The wreaths will tell you right now we're waiting on God. What do you mean? I'm waiting on the right person to come and walk in my house and give us an offer and buy that thing. But we're waiting on God. And we have been agreeing together that God's going to send the right person in the right time. It's going to make it happen. But the house has been on the market for a whole two weeks yet, and we don't have an offer, and I'm starting to get nervous. <sighs> waiting on God, right? Weeks can feel like months when you're waiting on God, can it? It really can. It's hard to wait on God. But look, listen to me, church. But it's when we wait on God that he renews our strength. 
They that wait upon the Lord, you shall. you wait upon the Lord, your strength is renewed. We, we prayed for months or maybe years and we see no visible signs of change in our children or whatever situation we're dealing with. No tangible evidence of God at work. We can begin to lose hope. We can begin to get frustrated. But his promise to us, when we wait upon the Lord, we will not faint. Hallelujah. God, what are you going to do when you're waiting upon the Lord, Pastor Jeff? I'm going to run and not grow weary. I'm going to walk and not faint. Hallelujah. I'm going to trust him and put my hope in him and let him be my peace that passes all understanding. Glory to God because I know that he's going to take care of me. He's going to meet my need and my children are in his hands so they're going to be all right. Hallelujah. Whew, that was better preaching than the way you responded. Glory to God. We wonder sometimes not only if heaven is closed to us, if, or really, is there anyone listening? Is there anyone there? Listen to these words of a very tired David. I said this was a very tired David. Psalms chapter 6, verse 3. David's being honest. He's crying out to God. And he's saying, God, not sick physically. This was a man who was sick spiritually. He was sick at heart. He was crushed. He was broken. He was a hurting man. He said, I'm sick at heart. And he just cried. I could hear him crying out to God saying, something to restore my children and to put a peace back in their lives, God. How long, oh Lord? When's it going to happen? And what are we doing the whole time? We're waiting. We're waiting. We're waiting. Another verse in the Bible talks about waiting. It says, I waited patiently before the Lord. I waited patiently before the Lord. How should I be waiting, Pastor Jeff? We should be waiting patiently, not waiting as a patient. <laughs> How do you wait as a patient? I don't know about you, but there's never been a time when I've been sitting in the doctor's office and just saying, oh, man, this is so good that I'm waiting. <laughs> I am enjoying this so much. I love these waiting rooms. I hope he takes an extra hour with the next patient. Woohoo! This is so much fun. I'm enjoying this and learning so much from this experience. Not waiting as a patient. That's frustrating waiting, right? That's wondering if you'll ever get out of there that it's turned into a hostage situation, right? But I waited patiently before God. And the rest of that scripture says this, and he heard my prayer. He heard my cry. He heard my prayer. He heard my cry. Come on, church. He heard my prayer. He heard my cry. Come on, I said he heard my prayer. He heard my cry. And you know what he did? He healed my child. He restored our relationship. He brought hope into our family again. He renewed us all together again. He made us one. Hallelujah. Let me tell you what. He put joy back in our family. All that anger and all that fighting and all that stuff gone, he stepped right in and he did a mighty work. He heard my prayer. He heard my cry. When we're sick at heart over the direction or difficulty in our child's life, we can be sure God will restore. He will restore us to a healthy confidence. He is working. Come on, my, my final word to you this morning is this. Hold on. Don't give up. 
Who knows when your breakthrough is just around the corner? And if you give up, you'll never get to that place of breakthrough. I've seen a lot of parents in my years of youth ministry. In fact, just yesterday, I was talking to one of our young men, and, and he said, you know, I invite a lot of my friends to come on Wednesday night, but their parents won't let them come. Their parents won't let them come. He said, you're going to figure out, Pastor Jeff, that my parents, my friends have different parents. He said, they're not like all the other parents. And he was talking about that most of them are drug addicts and most of them, many of them aren't even married. They're just two single people trying to raise these kids, you know? It's a different, totally different set of parents, just like a totally different set of kids nowadays. Hold on. Don't give up. When you get worn out from all the sobbing over the pain you've done in your child's life, you can be sure the Lord has seen your tears and the Lord has heard your weeping. In fact, I picture this. I picture him sitting down beside you and just weeping with you. That's the kind of God of compassion that we have. Amen? Our God of compassion has not left us. He has heard our pleas and he will answer. I said he's heard your plea and he will answer in his time, not ours. I said your children are developing in his time, not ours. <laughs> and here's something wild that in the light of eternity, it won't seem like it took long at all. Yeah? We'll understand it better by and by, right? One of these days we will. Praise God. Would you stand with me this morning? Mm. Words for desperate parents. I pray that these have been encouraging words for desperate parents. What was my goal today? My goal today was this to give you a pat on the back and encourage me and say, listen, you're not the only parent that is having problems right now. <laughs> you're not. So many times we can get our eyes on our situation and think that nobody else is experiencing what we're going through. T and I used to talk about that all the time and say, I wonder what people think, what kind of home that we have. <laughs> you know, a lot of times they'll put pastors on this pedestal. And they'll say, oh, their home must just be like revival all the time. And there's never any problems in their home, I'm sure, because, man, Pastor Jeff, he's right there with Jesus. Listen, the fact is, is that we're all sinners saved by grace. And that we are all human beings. And we all face the same struggles. We all do. So I wanted to just encourage you today and bring this word of encouragement to you. And to let you know, listen, hold on. Don't give up. Because I believe everything's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right tomorrow. I can't say that. Next week, I can't say that. I can't even say next month. But I do know this. If you hold on. What I believe we need to do as parents is to tie ourselves to the altar and not get up. We talk about in the Old Testament, the horns on the altar, the priests the sacrifice and they grab it cry out to God Jehovah that's what we need to do as moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas grab onto the horns of the altar and not let go and 
until we see our miracle. Amen?